Krishna's lifting of Govardhan Hill, of course, is one of the many pastimes in which Krishna saves his devotees. Uh, the material world is very dangerous and ultimately fatal because everyone that has a material body uh, loses that body. And so for people who identify with the body, which is almost everybody, um, we have to, if, one who identifies with the body has to go through a death experience. Uh, actually, the body is a type of virtual reality machine, but now we identify with it. So, but even for a pure devotee, even for a pure devotee, there are some events which are so, you could say, naturally shocking that the devotees cry out to Krishna. And so I want to make that distinction. For example, we know that we, uh, try, we, we need to get beyond what is called karma misra bhakti. Misra means mixed. It means bhakti mixed with karma, mixed with the desire to get sort of bang for your devotional buck. So that I, you know, I worship Krishna and then I get something in return. And it, it's premeditated, it's a plan, it's that I'm going to worship God and get something in return. Actually, not to speak of pure devotion, if you look at Bhagavad Gita, even if you look at Krishna's analysis of giving or charity in the three modes of nature, Krishna says that in the mode of goodness, the person is thinking, which means that a person gives with the idea that it's the right thing to do, that this should be given. So in general, the nature of goodness is that you do something because it's the right thing to do, because it should be done. And Krishna says, you give something which is anupakari ne. It's given to somebody who's not going to give you something in return. Like you're not giving, let's say, a big donation to a university to get your name on a building. Or let's say you help someone out and then you make sure everybody knows what you did. So that's more the mode of passion. Mode of passion, you want something in return for your giving. And the mode of goodness, you just get it all wrong. I mean, that's the typical typical analysis for Bhagavad Gita. In the mode of goodness, you get it right. In the mode of passion, it's kind of mixed. It's half right and half wrong. And in the mode of goodness, it's completely backward. So, in that sense, we worship Krishna, we give to Krishna, we offer to Krishna uh, not to get something in return, but because we are part of Krishna. And it's natural for us. It's the right thing for us to serve Krishna. But for example, consider this pastime of Govardhan. When Indra came and had a really bad idea, which was to attack Vrindavan and try to uh, humiliate Krishna, if not kill everybody. And the residents of Vrindavan cried out to Krishna. Also, for example, when big demons attacked Vrindavan, when there was a forest fire. Because there are certain events which are just so shocking to the nervous system, to the human nervous system, that one just cries out to Krishna. This is not the same as premeditated um, selfish worship. It, it's a different activity. And so we have, of course, the famous pastime of Lord Nrsingadev, saving Prahlad. We have this pastime where Krishna saves an entire community. In the case of Lord Nrsingadev, he saved an individual pure devotee. In this case, he saves an entire community. And of course, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna say, says he also saves planets. Because he says in Bhagavad Gita, yada yada hi dharma glanir bhavati bharata. Whenever a dharma, which by the way means injustice, dharma doesn't just mean performing some ritual. The word dharma in Sanskrit is probably the main word for justice, or one of the main Sanskrit words for justice. Dharma also is a, a common Sanskrit word for law. So to say that Krishna comes when a dharma is rising, it doesn't. It actually means that there's injustice, that there is corruption, and uh, there is not the rule by law. People are being oppressed, they're being harassed by, uh, in other words, powerful people get sufficient power to override law, override justice, and simply exploit and harass people for their own selfish interest, which is something like what's going on nowadays. If you know what's going on in the world today, where America and other 
so many other countries are becoming, they started out as democracies, they're now becoming what you could call plutocracies. Plutocracy means rule by the rich. You know, the golden rule, whoever has the gold makes the rules. <laughs> so, um, so Krishna says, yada yada hi dharma si glanir bhavati bharata, whenever a dharma, uh, actually whenever dharma becomes weakened, becomes debilitated, and yutanam, of yutanam. Every word in Sanskrit, actually every part of a word in Sanskrit is significant. So Krishna says he comes when there is, and this is a very good example of it, of course he was already there, he didn't come, but he acted. This is an example of Krishna correcting corruption or injustice even among his own representatives. This may not come as a, a shock to you, but sometimes even one claiming to be a representative of Krishna can do the wrong thing. And this is a good case. Because the devas, the demigods, I mean they're called devas in Sanskrit, and deva comes from the word, the root uh, div, which means divine. So their celestial beings are supposed to represent God. And yet Indra was, um, well, out of control. And so the word abhyutanam, abhi in Sanskrit means, can have the sense of, uh, I'll go on. I, uh, I charge by the minute, so. <laughs> anyway, so Avi has the idea of going against or sort of being aggressive, and ut means up, and tanam is standing. It's, it's an abbreviation of stanam. So abutanam means something which is aggressively rising up. That's literally what the word means. Abutanam adharmasya. Krishna says, tada, at that time, atmanam sajamiham, I manifest myself. And Krishna's program is, Paritranaya sadhunam, that I deliver uh, basically good people. Paritranaya sadhunam, vinashaya cha, and I sort of red card the bad guys, you know, out of the game. So vinashaya, Krishna removes the bad people. Vinashaya cha duskritam. I might have it myself. Oh, just here, go out, please go out and see if it's Virginia. And then you can call her back. The life of a busy company. So, <laughs> so abhyutanama dharmasya. Then Krishna says, paritranaya sadhunam. I rescue, I save good people, I remove the bad people, and dharmasam stapanatai. And I restore justice to the world. So, this is an example of it. Uh, so, we see that even if someone has an exalted position within a spiritual organization. And in a sense, you can say that the universe is a spiritual organization, ultimately, because God creates it, and Krishna creates it with a spiritual purpose. The whole purpose of the universe is ultimately to bring people back to their original spiritual nature, their relationship with Krishna. Therefore, the creation is, in Western philosophical terms, teleological. Uh, the Greek word telos means a purpose. And so teleology is the philosophical idea that there are intrinsic, objective purposes in the universe. For example, subjectively, you can just give yourself a purpose, like, I'm going to go have lunch. And so you could say that that's a subjective purpose. You just decide to do something. Or a group of people can decide to do something. But the idea of teleology is that outside of your mind, beyond your own feelings and ideas beyond the purposes you create for yourself or even create for other people, uh, there are objective purposes. So when the question is asked, why were you born, there's actually an answer. So that's called teleology. And the universe has an ultimate spiritual purpose. And Indra, uh, who is known by other names in other cultures such as Zeus, Jupiter. Jupiter, by the way, is Sanskrit. How many of you know Jupiter is a Sanskrit word? No? Okay. Um, good, now I feel better than you. <laughs> so, now that I've uh, boosted my self-esteem, I'll explain what the word means. Dew, dew in Sanskrit is actually a root from which you get the word deva and divya. It's the root of the word deva, god, and divya, divine. And then Peter, of course, is father. So Jew Peter, the father of heaven. 
So whether it's called Zeus also actually, if you know Greek, a Zeus or a Zeus is just a Greek form of Deva or Deus, which is Sanskrit. So both the words Zeus and Jupiter are from Sanskrit and uh, mean the same thing. So um, so the whole so Indra, who's the kind of like the chairman of the board of the universe, chairman of the administration, administrator, CEO, chief executive officer of the universe, and even Indra became bewildered by his power. <clears throat> so we see this. The history of religion, I mean, probably if, if you looked at world history and you said, where do you find the greatest amount of hypocrisy in world history, at least one strong candidate would be religions. And perhaps because in religions there's so much, there's such a generous field, because religions make the highest claims. Religions tend to claim that uh, their leaders are in touch with God, they have privileged knowledge of the highest things, and that by uh, joining them, you get salvation, you get to God. And so because religion, more than any other human institution, or any other human tradition, uh, well, it, 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 makes, it makes the greatest claims. Because a politician may simply say, I'll balance the budget, or I'll defend the country or something. But religion makes the highest and the most uh, ambitious claims. And therefore, it has the most facility, or, or not facility, the most um, the greatest possibility uh, of hypocrisy. Actually, Prabhupada said this himself, because he used to say that he used to quote this English proverb that Caesar's wife must be above suspicion. In other words, if someone has a very high suspicion, uh, uh, position. Actually, I, I didn't really know Caesar was married, but I guess he must be. So, anyway, um, so one of our first duties, those of us who are uh, involved in a spiritual institution, those of us who even claim to be representing it, to be leaders, uh, we have this great responsibility not to fall into this historical trap of hypocrisy. And of course, hypocrisy simply means that I claim to be representing God, I claim to be acting on spiritually, but in fact, in some way, I'm gratifying my own desires. And, and that's what happened to Indra. I, I'm bringing this up not be to, to honor a, you know, a, a great discontradition of not speaking about the verse or you know, kind of getting, <laughs> getting off the specific topic in the class. But, but actually, that's really what happened to Indra. That's really what happened to Indra. He became proud of the position he held in God's service as a defender of justice in the universe. And he attacked, he sort of bit the hand that fed him, or tried to, he attacked Krishna, and uh, he was chastised and he was corrected. So those, I think, are, are, are perhaps the main lessons to learn here, that, that we do have a supreme protector, who is God, or Krishna, but that also uh, we will be corrected if we act badly, if we do the wrong thing. And that we should be very careful of becoming proud. Because after all, I mean, I mean look, look at the, I mean, where do you find a greater opportunity to become proud and arrogant than in, an, than, than in a culture that claims that if you do what we're doing, you're better than everyone else? So if someone's in the market for vanity, you know, this is one-stop shopping. Because after all, we claim that if you do what we're doing, you're better than everybody else. A devotee is better than a karmi, better than a jnani, better than a yogi. And uh, this is actually a kind of, uh, it's an interesting irony, because ultimately, unless we succumb to kind of like the philosophical foolishness of radical relativism, in other words, if you say that there ultimately is no highest truth, first of all, the obvious response to that would be, well, how do you know? Because if someone says there is no highest truth, then that becomes the highest truth, so it's self-contradictory. It's like never say never. So if there is no highest truth, then you can't say there is no highest truth. So you can't say it. I mean, ultimately, if we 
And, and there is evidence that reality is hierarchical. For example, they have, uh, well, well, for example, Olympic Games, and someone turns out to be the fastest human being alive in a particular event, of course, there are different events. Or someone turns out to be the greatest, um, I don't know, golfer, which is spiritually significant. Or they even have beauty contests, we won't go there, especially because one of the people involved in beauty contests is threatening to destroy the world now. <laughs> but, I mean, there's, a, or for example, people take tests. There are most prestigious colleges. Everywhere we look, there are hierarchies. And we, in fact, even in your personal relationships, you make judgments like that. Some people say, like for example, let's say you choose to have a relationship with this person, not that person. Why? I think this is a better person this person is better for me. I mean, so everywhere you look, we find hierarchy. Human beings tend to be more intelligent than animals, but with many exceptions. What is that bumper sticker, my border collie is more intelligent than your honor student? <laughs> so, so ultimately, ultimately, there is a, an infinitely beautiful person. There's an infinitely powerful person because why would we think there's not? If you see in this world that there are gradations of beauty, you know, like this person and that person and the other person, I mean, everyone does this, even though it's not politically correct to say it. You're supposed to say, no, everyone's beautiful, which is true in its own way. But people do make choices. I mean, can anyone here say that in choosing a partner and choosing a relationship, they're absolutely indifferent to gradations of beauty? <laughs> like it means absolutely nothing to you. I mean, who can say that? So in the real world, we actually do kind of rate people. As you know, I'm not saying that's the highest state of consciousness, but but there are gradations of beauty in the world. And so why should we say that uh, there is no ultimate beauty? There's no absolute beauty. In fact, the very fact that there are in gradations philosophically implies it. For example. If you say that New York is north of South Carolina, what does that mean? It had, New York is north of South Carolina only in relation to an absolute north, which is the North Pole. So what we really mean is it's closer to the North Pole than South Carolina. So if you take away the North Pole, if there's no absolute reference point, then you can't actually rate things. You can't say that this is more anything than that. And so the very fact you say this is more beautiful than that, or this is stronger than that, it, Im it implies that ultimately there is an ultimate reference point. And so that ultimate reference point is God. And so in, in that sense, whenever we love anything in this world, like if you, if you find anything attractive in this world, whether another person, or a scene in nature, or, or anything, you're actually attracted to God. Every attraction, every attachment is a form of God consciousness, but it may be indirect. And that's what Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, Yajati Bhuti Matsatam. Anything in this world that is that is has special merit or is glorious or powerful, Yajati Bhuti Matsatam, Srima, which is beautiful, Urjitam, or whatever, you know, energetic, that in every single case, it is simply, well, as it's translated in the BBT Gita, the spark of my splendor. It's simply what Krishna says, a tejo angsa. It's just a little, a fraction, Krishna says, of my own splendor. And so, if you, as Arjun says in the Gita, sarvam samat noshi tadosi sarvam, he says to Krishna that you encompass you or everything. That means anything you're attracted to is a certain level of God consciousness. It's a, certain, it's a certain stage of God consciousness because in one sense there is nothing in the universe but Krishna. Because everything is Krishna's energy. So, um, anyway, some people have difficulty with the idea that God is a person, which is kind of strange because you're a person. I mean, we're all persons, right? And, and suicide is not healthy, whether it's uh, physical or philosophical. Suicide is just not a healthy thing to do. Uh, so 
I mean, to embrace some kind of philosophy where you ultimately demolish yourself through meditation, it's like, I think, you know, the question is like, what are you doing? I mean, are you really that unhappy? Do you really see no possibilities for yourself? <laughs> I mean, the idea of just kind of like merging into some corporate effulgence. I mean, that's hell. That, that's, I mean, God. I think I'd rather be locked in a room and forced to listen to public radio fundraising drives or something. <laughs> which is like the worst punishment I could think of. So, you know, Prabhupada gave this great example that if, if you have, let's say, some infection say in your hand, and it's very painful, the solution is not to cut your hand off. The solution is to heal your hand. So just, just to wrap this up, because uh, I'm competing with your lunch right now. I'm competing with my own lunch. So my rational self-interest to start with, to stop within a reasonably short period of time. So the idea is that, um, why would you not want to be a person? It's only because you're a person that you're free. I mean, freedom. I mean, don't you value freedom? What about loving relationships? And yet, if you're not a person, if you're not ultimately a person, then your freedom, your loving relationships, it's all just a big illusion. It's all just nonsense. Because it's not who you are. In fact, you don't exist. Why would someone want to do that to themselves? And so if you understand that you're really a person, you really are, maybe we're not perfect persons now, you know, we're, maybe we identify with our bodies, like some people identify with their clothes, there, there's of course a whole billion dollar industry in New York dedicated to that. Some people identify with their cars, when I was growing up, I, I'm from California, and um, we, I mean the Beach Boys became very popular when I was a kid, and uh, you had these love songs to cars. Anyway, so just like in ancient, actually pre-Islamic Arabia, they have love songs to camels, but that's what they're talking about. So in California, they have love songs to cars. So I mean, obviously, obviously, we are not our cars, we are not our clothes, and also, I mean, the body, as a you know, we are something eternal. Because if if I want to identify with my body, I'm actually condemning myself because. There's overwhelming evidence that my body will die someday. And so if our bodies are going to die, why would you want to be something which is a total loser in that sense? I mean, I'm not anti-body. I don't hate my body. I don't self-flagellate it you know, at night when I'm alone. I keep healthy, and I'm happy to be healthy and all that. I eat organic food. However, ultimately... Ultimately, when you're choosing what to identify with, like who am I really, why would your first choice be something, a horse that's never going to come in? I mean, why not try to find out if you're eternal or not? Why not search for your real self? And so, uh, only if, only if there's a personal God, which some people think they've outgrown intellectually, uh, because they actually aren't that smart. But if you, if there's a personal God, it means that you, as a free, beautiful individual, can last forever. It means all your greatest hopes to be free, to be wise, to be in love. These things actually, all these things can come true. And they can come true forever. But all of our deepest wishes for beauty, for love, for freedom, can come true only if reality itself is ultimately personal and your present sense of being a free individual person is ultimately true. So, uh, anyway, today is Krishna, the day Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill, That's, uh, which means that the good news is God is actually stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger at the time. <laughs> Stronger than actually than all the Transformers and Terminators put together. <laughs> so why did Krishna come to lift a mountain? It's like a really clever thing to do. <laughs> I mean, it's fun. It's like, okay, I'm going to lift a mountain today. And he, you know, it's amusing. So.
So, and actually, also in this story, another important point that Krishna is establishing monotheism. This is one of the stories in the Bhagavatam that strongly establishes monotheism. If you read sort of like, I don't know, learned articles on religion or you know whatever in the New Yorker magazine, people endlessly say that on the one hand you have the monotheistic traditions of the world, which are Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and the other hand you have Hinduism, which is polytheistic, and Buddhism, Buddhism which as often, but not always, atheistic. And people don't realize that this very powerful monotheistic tradition, one God, is actually found in, in South Asia, the Vaishnava tradition. But it's very common. You find professors saying this. You find you know, academic articles saying this. It's just kind of like a, a mantra they keep saying over and over again, as if there was no mono, like monotheism never came from anywhere outside the Middle East. But actually, it does come, this very powerful tradition goes all the way back in Sanskrit literature, the Rig Veda. I saw it actually in an advertisement for a yoga studio in somewhere in Manhattan, where it's quoting, it has something in English. It said, what did it say? That uh, one truth called by many names, which is actually a quotation from the Rig Veda, the oldest Sanskrit literature. So um, interestingly, Monotheism was never understood as sectarian in the ancient the Vedic culture. It was always understood from the beginning. There's one God for everyone, called by different names, worshipped in different ways. But ultimately, I mean, wouldn't you prefer to have an infinitely beautiful God? And what's the alternative? Because if God is infinitely beautiful, that means beauty itself is real. It's not just that we're neurologically wired by evolution to think that something is beautiful because then we'll, I don't know, reproduce or something. So an infinitely beautiful God is really good news for everyone. And because we're part of God, it means we are also, we also have incredible beauty as souls. And, and uh, it means that, because I mean, everyone really wants to be good looking, I think. I think it's a natural human desire. And the good news is everyone is. Spiritually, I mean, you, the real you, is beautiful beyond uh, all extreme makeovers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll end there. So in every, in every sense, it's, our, it's an original self-interest to become Krishna conscious, to try to understand Krishna and these, and these activities of Krishna. So any questions? Yes? Uh, you mentioned... Um, the Gwani or Bhagavad Gita Bharata verse. Yes. And the, I was just wondering if you could maybe briefly go through like the dynamics of how like the Krishna consciousness movement could kind of, you know, Krishna coming and you know, saving people today, like how, how that works. Oh. Dynamics. Well, uh, Prabhupada used to say that the modern world, because it lacked spirituality, was like a headless body. And then we have this come, which is kind of like a disembodied head. So um, we have to find the ways and means to, um, to help people. For example, God forbid if someone in your family was really in trouble or really in danger. I mean, you know, in, in a loving family, everyone drops everything and just goes to the rescue. That's just the way good families operate. And so Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita that because he's the father and the mother, by the way, not just Padri and Filio, because he's the father and the mother of the universe, therefore there's only one family in the universe. I mean, obviously there's different bio families and all that, but from a higher perspective, there's only one family in the universe. The whole universe is a single family. And therefore, if we really get it, if we really understand Krishna consciousness, uh, then we become, we dedicate ourselves to trying to help other people. We care, we care fully about everyone. And we dedicate our life to helping people. That's a sign of self-realization. If someone doesn't feel the urgency to, to help this world, then that person hasn't deeply understood Krishna consciousness or bhakti yoga. Because the realization you have, Krishna says that. 
unless you see that everyone is equal, unless you see that everyone matters, that everyone has a kinship tie with you, then only thus can you achieve the highest bhakti. And that famous verse, Vidya, uh, Bina, Sampane, etc., Pandita, Samadarshana. The truly wise person see that they see everyone equally. Krishna sees everyone equally. Everyone is equally valuable in the eyes of God. And so that inspiration, that urgency to really change the world or, or spiritualize the world, to do everything possible, and to adopt practical means to do what it takes. And if this is not working, try that. It's like, I mean, have you ever seen a, one of those Tom Cruise movies where he's saving the world again? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like they have those summer blockbuster movies. And they're just people are desperately trying, like an asteroid is going to collide with the Earth and destroy life as we know it. Or there's been another alien invasion. And so if you think of those movies, like, you know, people just do everything, like whatever it takes. How can we save the planet? And that should be the mood of, uh, that should be our mood. We should just, and that was Prabhupada's mood, by the way. We should just do it. And, and when you really feel that way, like, we, you know, we have this mantra we chant every day, Paschati Deshacharine, to Prabhupada, you know, the savior of the Western world. Well, it hasn't happened yet. So that's real God consciousness to me. I mean, I mean, obviously there are different levels of God consciousness and everyone does their best and, you know, all that. But when one really becomes advanced, then you deeply, profoundly care about other people and just all living beings. And with, you know, in your own way, everyone has their own way of doing it. Everyone has their own circumstances, their own worldly duties and family and profession and this and that. But everyone in their own way, within their own situation, dedicates their life to saving the planet. And, and that's a sign of real Krishna consciousness. So thank you all very much. And uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you.